I talk now. Talk one now. call, one call, tell me you see me late. See me late. I ain't really worried about no motherfucking hate. Nope. Nope. I'm just really stacking cheese, I'm just stacking paper. Stacking paper. Kicked up in the field, can't you tell my patient? Got sending at your time, yeah, so I'm We up, we up. On, flee. on flee. Gotta stay on my hustle, gotta keep elevating. Elevate. Got the rack stacked up, yeah, I'm hella cake. Tell me what you're saying, yeah, I get that. Let's do this, let's do this. And this, this is. So excited, man! Thank you for uh, joining me on the show, man. I, uh, I mean, we got a lot to cover. We got some questions in too, some mailbag questions. That's gonna be pretty fun. So, uh, right. Rothman, how you doing? I know you said you had a you know a hard training um, sparring going on. So, how's that going? Yeah, uh, today we had a couple of killers in the gym. Um, got my ass handed to me quite a few times, but I mean, it is what it is, you know. True. Um, but other than that, I mean, it's always a pleasure, though, like being in the gym and stuff. How's things on your end? I ain't been able to see and talk to you in the, in a while. So how, how's everything going on on your end, bro? Oh, man, it's going great, man. Just starting the podcast up. I'm getting so much uh, positive feedback from people. Um, you know, just it's been going great, man. To be honest, like my first episode with Coach Russell Stone, um, I don't know if you got to check that out. I mean, it's it's pretty long, but... Uh, that had over 500 views, like all over like different platforms from Spotify, hey, YouTube, hey. Facebook. I mean, it's that's how it starts, man. A lot of people, I've come to find out, like uh, when they they release something, they want like a huge following base, like from the get go. And I'm like, dude, you you gotta establish the groundwork, like unless you are an established like personality, you're not gonna have like millions thousands views off the giggle but 500 for your first that is a perfect way to actually start i oh, mean yeah. that, that's extremely impressive for your first uh, podcast so thank you man thank you no no problem man no problem so let's let's dive into uh to you man because you know um you to me are one of the most interesting people man you know you got from you know, being a photographer to uh, you doing films and also mixed martial arts. I mean, let's dive in to get to know you for, you know, my audience, because I've been promoting this out and a lot of them want to know, you know, more about you because most of them have a hard time just doing one profession. And it's like you're doing three. Plus, I'm pretty sure you got some stuff that I don't even know about just yet. So let's dive uh, into uh, some of that, man. OK, so. Um, from the get-go, for your viewers, uh, my name is Alfred Graham. I'm actually the third. My father is a junior, and my grandfather is the original. Uh, I'm 25. I graduated from Western class of 2013. Now, like most people, like most people from uh, Western, they want to go into the military, a good chunk of them, even if that ain't what they originally wanted. Uh, I wanted to go into the military. Unfortunately, uh, it was about a month and some change before I actually graduated. So I had my contract. I had my ship out date. I was ready to go. But instead of being able to ship out a month, a month and a half before we graduated, mm -hmm. I ended up having a seizure out of nowhere. Now, I've had a total of three seizures in my life. Uh, once when I was like an infant, once when I was like four years old, and then, of course, the one my senior year of high school, which disqualified me. Now, they told me five years down the road, I could sit there and retry and uh, become uh, enlisted that way again if I ain't had no outbursts or anything like that. But at 18 years old, the only thing you wanted to do was serve in the military and then it basically being taken away from you. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I pissed and moaned around my mom's house for, uh, shit, probably three solid months. I worked a factory job. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, but in the process of all of this, I was consuming large amounts of movies, uh, large amounts of films. I mean, I was watching your B-list films. I was watching like your Oscar films. I was watching stuff off YouTube and not so much to, uh, where I'm at now, literally today, all I do is just nonstop consume film. If it's something I've seen, I'll watch it again. If it's something I haven't seen. Uh, but back then I was just watching it and I didn't realize it was a coping mechanism for me. Mm -hmm. um, because when I was upset, because I was reminded of, oh, I couldn't serve, I couldn't do this, I couldn't do that. 
mm-hmm. I sat there and would just watch a movie and I realized it was like a drug for me. My, my personality, my emotions would change rapidly. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was shortly, shortly near the end of 2013, I wanted, I, I fully decided, you know what? Movies is where it's at. I want to make a movie. I knew nothing about what the mm-hmm. filmmaking process at all. Didn't have a camera, didn't have no audio gear, didn't have, I mean, like, all I knew was. And this, and I was like, well, shit. I don't have um, I don't have the time to sit there and or not the time, but I don't have the the, the finances to make a hundred million dollar movie. Oh yeah. Uh, let me figure some of this stuff out. So I sat there and I dove in like how I dove in with just watching movies in general. I dove in with the screenwriting process. I dove in with uh, like frame rates, understanding why certain films are shot in twenty four. Summer shot in 25. Uh, and then after that, I started picking together movies and really deconstructing it. And then I was like, okay, well, I sort of understand this. Let me buy a camera. So I went to the local Walmart, bought a cheap $300 Sony uh, DCSH 300. It's like a $250 camera back then. And I, I bought a cheap little memory card, stuck it in there. Uh, this camera instead of actual camera batteries ran off of double A batteries mm-hmm. and so I was like all right time to start making movies next thing I know there was nothing in there at all that was usable uh, I had like a three minute time record limit on the camera uh, <laughs> uh, everything was like really really dark mm-hmm. and I was like well damn how do I like even if I was like highlighting because I wanted to do um interviews at first just to like really understand how everything worked with the camera oh, yeah. and I was like yo I'm, I'm not understanding why none of this is happening so I did more research into it and I found that's how I learned about Aperture uh, which for your listeners if you don't know what Aperture is mm-hmm. it's where the lens itself is letting in as much light or as little light as the lens itself can handle so imagine like this here is the camera lens in whole If I'm opening up the lens, this is as wide as it goes, so a lot of light can go in. Mm -hmm. If you close off your aperture, you're actually smaller, uh, making the hole smaller, which Mm -hmm. is allowing less light to come in, which, of course, is allowing uh, the subject that you're shooting to not be properly lit. Now, of course, you can work around that with, like, your shutter speed and stuff like that, and we'll get into that later, probably, but... For a two, almost $300 camera, you're not getting none of that function whatsoever. And I was I, like... I understand, man. <laughs> uh, so I was uh, starting out, I was like, okay, well, I need to take a step back. I need to figure out uh, what makes a certain image work. Because the actual scientific name for film is motion pictures. So I was like, well, if I can make a single frame pop, I should be able to make a whole series of frames and a little skit film thing pop and look really good. Or at least that was the attitude I had. And that's actually what started my path towards photography. I never wanted to do photography, never had any interest in photography. It was, well, I need to figure out how to make all these images look good. But in order to do that, I had to figure out how to make one image look good. And that's crazy to me because like when I first met you, I'm seeing you, you know, we talked, um, I think we was going to Charlie, was hanging out with Charlie for yep. his birthday. And you tell me you're, you're a photographer and you're working on films and stuff. And I've seen some of your work and you make like some amazing pictures. That's why it's, it's blows me away for you to be like, man, I don't even want to be a photographer, <laughs> but like you take some great pictures, man. I, uh, I really appreciate that. Um, photography, like I said, was not an interest I wanted. And it's slowly uh, for a long time. Uh, as you'll figure out here in a little bit when I fully discuss it, it sort of encompassed my life to where it was where I was making a living off of it. And I actually put film on the back burner for a really long time. Mm -hmm. Um, But 
I started getting to the point with a little $200 camera, I was getting to the point where like, uh, the correct term is the, the camera itself, you outgrew the camera. I, at the, when I was doing it, I was like, yo, I think I'm breaking the camera because it was taking so long for the camera to do exactly what I wanted because I was getting so uh, intricate with how I wanted the images to look um, that I realized that I needed to upgrade. And so I shot with the, with the, the Sony for, it was right at about a year and maybe a year and a half right at a year and three quarters before I finally realized, yo, if I, I'm ever going to pursue uh, like getting paid for my images and stuff. And at this point, this is my portfolio being built up that nobody has seen any of those pictures strictly because I was like, yo, I don't think these look good. Now, some people have seen like a couple of the original photos I had t took mm -hmm. and through the process of doing all of that, uh, they were like, yo, no, these are really good. And I, looking back, I'm like, yo, no, this is trash. Like, <laughs> that's, dark. That's, the part of, that's the part of growing, man. You know, you're just yeah. growing. <laughs> so uh, a friend of mine was like, I was talking to who did the photography they were like, well, I mean, if this is what you're really trying to do, like, you know, film is what you want to do. You can't do anything with that particular camera film wise. So they told me they were like, you might want to invest in a DSLR, uh, which is the next step in, uh, in, a, in cameras. Um, you have entry level DSLRs all the way up to high end professionals. Um, so I was doing my research and these cameras are a whole lot more expensive than $200. Uh, and the first camera I was looking at was the first camera I ended up buying when I went to upgrade, which was a Canon T5i. Uh, it had an articulating screen. It shot a 1080p video, but it was a crop sensor. Um, mm. So what that meant, means for your viewers is instead of it being like a full piece of film, which is 35 millimeters, it was depending on the brand because Nikon's, their crop sensors are different. Uh, Sony's is different than Canon, so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, Canon's though is if you take 35 millimeters and you put say like um, uh, a 75 millimeter uh, lens onto the camera, even though it's shooting 35 millimeter, it should show up as 75 millimeters. Yep. But if you put it on a crop sensor camera, you actually take the 75 and times it by 1.35. So 75 uh, millimeters then turns into like 120, if I'm not mistaken, or at least around that general vicinity, mm -hmm. which if you want telephoto is wonderful, but I'm not wanting telephoto at times. I'm wanting wide angle lenses because I want the viewer to be able to see everything that I'm seeing. Okay. And so like that 14 millimeter turns into a 35 millimeter lens and it just starts doing all that. But what I was learning, which is all personally, I think the best way to do it, uh, mm -hmm. if you want to learn, because a lot of people, they'll push, oh, go to a school for photography, go to school to film. Yeah. I am living proof. You do not need to do anything remotely close to that. You just need to Amen. drive. You just need to drive and you need to understand that, hey, it's not going to look like this overnight. I got to figure out what like makes it look that way. There's so much useful material off of YouTube, just off of the Internet in itself that like you can really invest in and Amen. they break stuff down, which is how I learned. Um, that's, that's how I'm actually learning myself, too, because like people were telling me, hey, you should go to this school and, you know, learn about radio and broadcasting and learn. About, and I'm like, mm, I don't really want to just yet. I mean, not throwing that away. I mean, school is very important, but I'm really just like you. I'm literally just learning, just going for it, man. I'm going off passion, drive. You know, I yeah. love talking to people, love learning their stories. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to let the chips lie where they may. And I'm just going to continue to grow from here. And I love that that's actually the step you took because one of the questions was, did you go to uh, to film school or anything for us? Because, I mean, you take some really good, you know, pictures and stuff. So for you just to talk about that and how you're basically going off passion, research, dedication, I mean, that's 
that's amazing, man. I can't tell you how proud I am of you, man. That's great. Yeah, uh, and that's honestly it, – it's bad to say, but for instance, the only thing about film school. Film mm-hmm. school, from what I've gathered from talking to colleagues who actually went to film school, film school is a good resource to building connections. That way, you're going to film school to be a cinematographer, which is the person who's actually behind the camera. A lot of people think it's the director that's behind the camera. The director, honestly, against them, on paper, they're going to go with them, regardless if they see their demo reel or anything like that. So if that's how you're trying to do it, I definitely recommend film school. But if you have the aspect and the drive like I do, Nine times out of 10, I'm going to lose to the person who has the paper credentials. But the moment they ask for a demo reel, I guarantee you it flips to seven times out of 10 in my favor just because, okay, you're going to try and do this. You're going to go buy the book. I know buy the book isn't necessarily going to work all the time. So I'm going to go this route. And I'm going to give you the same product that you want, which honestly won me a couple of gigs I did uh, early in my uh, career where I was actually underselling people because pricing automatically you go to somebody who's from film school. They want that film school type money oh, like yes. uh, per day. I think it is like an entry level director of cinematography wants uh like thirteen hundred dollars a day and that's if they're not even part of the union so if they're not part of any type of union they're like oh i want thirteen hundred dollars they'll come talk to me uh well we want this well how long you want me to shoot for it'll be an all-day shoot three days okay you give me 700 bucks and i'll get it done so it's also about like how you hustle on that aspect that's true the uh i got like i said the the t5i and I've actually used the T5i for right at two, three years until I realized, okay, I really am wanting to do film again. So I needed, I needed the 35 millimeter um, uh, full sensor DSLR simply because of the fact that like, hey, uh, when it comes to film, yo, like film is presented on 35 millimeter i want to make it look as realistic or not necessarily as realistic but as closely resemble what it is Mm -hmm. for your 35 millimeters uh than the crop sensor because that just helps out in post-production as well uh when you're doing everything yourself which for the first first four five projects i did I did everything myself. And then finally, I was like, okay, the next project I'm going to release to the world, like I'm going to get people who actually know what the hell they're doing. Like I'm decent at editing video, but I want somebody who (laughs) asks, who asks, like they actually know that's all they do is edit. I laugh a little bit at that because I was literally talking with a, a friend of mine yesterday when I was like, man, starting this podcast was so cool like in the head until you realize like, like with me, I'm doing, you know, audio and video. I ain't no yep. crap about editing and just learning it. I'm like, Oh my God. Like, I don't know if it was like really like tough for you at first, but like for me, like I went all these different types of software. I started with the free ones. Like the one I like using is a uh, DaVinci uh, 16 or 19. Da DaVinci uh, I, hands down, even though it's free. Now, if you upgrade to the full version, Mm-hmm. it's industry proven like they're uh hold on i'm looking at my huge library of film here real quick here you go uh-huh. just for shits and giggles uh hereditary was shot and edited on da vinci really like the full version was shot and edited on da vinci uh there's so many film films that like you'll never believe like everybody thinks oh i need a I use Adobe Premiere, I I won't lie, but there's so many people who think, oh, I got to have Adobe Premiere, that's what the industry uses, that's all I hear about. Mm -hmm. Adobe Premiere is good. It makes everything accessible because it's all in the program. DaVinci, 
I give it to Da Vinci because Da Vinci's color grading, the palettes on that thing, especially if you're shooting raw video, which we can talk about that a little bit, sure. is uh, raw video is uncompressed video. So uh, you take a simple camera, like your camera phone, you record something. Mm -hmm. It's being recorded uh, basically in a small file such as MP4, MOV, uh, FVL, there's a couple other, uh, like you might have ProRes, stuff like yep. that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's like the file container, which is all compressed video where the sensor in the phone or the camera is making all the decisions for you. So mm -hmm. it's registering my shirt's white, it's going to pop up white. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it might be washed out, sometimes it might not. It's all how the camera sensor is seeing it through its own brain. Mm -hmm. Raw, it does not care. Mm -hmm. It's seeing everything as you're seeing it, but it's extremely flat. So colors don't pop, shadows are everywhere at times, and that's where you have all the information. Because with like one of them small MP4 files, that four or five minute video might be at most maybe a gigabyte, mm -hmm. but that's very rarely. You might see that uh, more so on the lines of it being just a couple hundred megabytes. Raw, no, you can throw that out the window. For <laughs> a, a, a four minute clip of straight raw video, you're looking at like 10, 15 gigabytes of just data there. Because it's all uncompressed and it's your all the information is there for you to literally tinker with as you see and want. Um, which is why, uh, like film is so important to like understand the basics of because you can shoot, like, for instance, a couple of the things I, I do, uh, like my little vlogs I do for small companies and stuff. I don't worry about shooting raw. Mm -hmm. They don't care about raw. They just want the video to look somewhat nice and they want it to play back completely as is. Not that hard. I literally take a couple clips, piece them together, yada, yada, yada. Done deal right there. Mm -hmm. uh, something like a film though. No, you want that thing absolutely 100% shot raw. And then that's when you take it scene by scene and you add the color grades, color corrections, you fix the audio and so on and so forth like that. Um, well, it, it seems like when you're like recording with raw, it's so much more like hands on of like every yes. little detail you have to like put yes. in. So that's and that's how when it comes to film, that's honestly how it is. So like I can make a feature length film with my Canon 6D, which is what I shoot with now. It's a full-frame DSLR. Mm -hmm. But no matter how much I use it, it's never shooting raw. It's not meant to shoot raw. It still shoots in MOV format. So it's a compressed H.264 format, which is what a lot of your TV is when it's all said and done for your listeners. So, like, you watch a regular TV show on TV, yeah, it's 1080p or it's uh, UHD. It's... Uh, however it's being presented to you but the actual file extension is an h264 format which is extremely extremely easily uh easy to access to where i could take it from the tv put it to the computer and the computer even if it's a basic computer can run it because it doesn't take a lot of processing power now once you start talking about like raw and stuff like that like the laptop i'm talking to you on right now barely handles raw at all so when I was shooting raw video for the couple of Halloween skits I did, um, I actually went to my editor for those projects and I was like, hey, we can't use my laptop. My laptop will literally die on me 30 seconds into it. it was, <laughs> and uh, I learned that the hard way because I actually did, uh, I tried doing it myself the first Halloween skit when, until I realized I absolutely needed to uh, – have an editor or at least somebody who has the system to you want somebody who's overall edit, but then you want to send it to somebody who does the actual color grading that does the actual uh color correction because there's a difference between color correction and color grading 
color oh, correction. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning that the hard way. <laughs> yeah. I was playing around with uh, my coloring on DaVinci and uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's so much detail, but I mean, I'm just, I'm glad to learn. So yeah, keep, continue to break that down for the listeners. Uh, yeah, so for your listeners, what color correction is when you're using raw, it, it, it still can work with like anything that's not raw, but it's less likely because once again, that's your uh, camera sensor picking up all the information for you through, because the sensor is basically the brain while the lens is recording to the memory card. Um, which if you want to do it is like your, uh, your heart or your memory. Uh, but the brain aspect is the sensor. So it's picking up everything, uh, that it sees. So it's going to see your whites and it's going to be like, okay, this is white, but it might not be a bright white. It might be a shadowy white or a beige white, or mm -hmm. maybe a sandy white and so on and so on and so forth. You can fix it and color correction, but you can't really fine tune it like you want to. Now with raw, with everything being a flat matte color, I want my whites to look pearly white. I can, even though they're not technically pearly white when I shot them, maybe they got a couple stains in them or something like that. You can go, you can fix that up a little bit and then you can go with the color correction and be like, okay, it looks pearly white. Mm -hmm. Now what color grading is, is the overall finished project getting it? It's basically sunshades. It's getting you put the sunshades on the film, and it's giving you the look all the way through the film as an even look. So mm. if it's really cool, so it looks blue almost the whole time, that's when your color grade comes in. If it's real warm, everything almost has like an orange tint to it. Yep. It's got a warm color grade to it. Now you can get really frisky with it and you can get some like crazy color grades in there. Um, well above what I can do. That's when you want to approach somebody who actually edits and color corrects and grades for a living. But something basic like a podcast like you or even just my Halloween skits and stuff like that. A simple, I call, okay, I want my, my blues to be a little bluer. I want my whites to definitely be whiter, so on and so forth. A, a simple color correction is all that is. Um, but, because uh, I know we keep sidetracking, so I'm trying to keep you on par. Uh, so with, once I bought the T5i, I still wasn't working as much on the film at that point. Mm -hmm. I was still doing photography. And eventually, one of my friends, uh, who is a musician, actually a well-known musician, I won't throw his name out there like that, though, uh, but I guarantee you, plenty of people have heard heard a lot of his music. Uh, he was actually going on his very first tour ever, and he needed photographers. So there were two of us, and in the process, this is how I got my first paid gig um, through the process. They were, or he was like, look, it's our small gig, pretty much depends how the gigs go, depends how much you get paid. We can pay for your hotel. We can pay for your food. Uh, how's a hundred bucks a night sound? Okay, that sounds pretty good. And it was through that that I really started liking concert photography, and which is actually where a lot of my... Uh, a lot of my experience comes from is through the concert photography using light sources that I already have present with me because a lot of people they make fun of me or did make fun of me. Mm -hmm. uh, not, I don't like camera flashes, artificial light. Yeah, you can fix it, but to me, I still see the artificialness to it. So mm -hmm. I like using the natural lights there. So with concerts, you got all the flashing lights going off and everything like that. There's no real need for a flash. So I slowly learned how to adapt to that. So like nowadays when I have a client, well, how come you don't use flashes? I don't need a flash. I know how to work my camera to give me what I want. So there we have it. If anything, I'll set up an external light source, mm -hmm. which is a whole lot better to use. But even then, I rarely use light sources. Only like the high paying studio jobs, which I've only had three high paying studio jobs with, uh, I think really require an external light system. But I did that for 
Mm. That's actually um, like later on in the show uh, with some of the mailbag questions. I actually have one. Uh, someone actually asked about like uh, they remember seeing you uh, go on tour. Like you were posting about it, but we'll, we'll get to that a little later. But yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you're, uh, you know, that was actually where you started and like developed that passion. And, you know, just from what you've talked about from, you know, Raw and then just, just breaking down like video, like who do you like credit? Like, I know you did a lot of your research on your own, but like who do you credit to like kind of like help like break it down? Because that's a lot that you, you know, you took it in and still, you know, learn to this day. But who's the one that like you leaned on to like, Hey, what do you think about this lens, or what do you think about this coloring, or how should I do this? Okay, uh, not to like when it came to photography, not to like toot my own horn too much, but that was all me. Um, when it comes now, when it comes to video, I'll be blatantly honest. Like, if it weren't for a couple of like my sister, for instance, uh. If it won't for my sister, if it won't for a couple of like my cousin that I consider my brother and everything like that, they're the ones that see literally like my hair is wild, especially when I'm shooting because of the simple fact like I literally feel like I'm pulling my hair out every single day when it comes to actually shooting a project mm -hmm. because like especially if it's just me and I'm long gunning it, I'm like, oh, did I get the right shot? Did I do this? Did I do that? Mm -hmm. Um and like they'll see the like beginning steps of the footage and they're like no no chill out like you got this definitely what you i see you're talking about here do this and do that but uh as for photography i looked at a couple of magazines ryan loco on instagram if you want to follow him uh ryan loco as one word um i looked at a lot of his stuff because he does a lot of like uh fight photography uh, and things of that nature and I was looking to see how their colors looked and then I was looking at a lot of photographers not to name drop uh, all the net photographers because some of these people uh, with all due respect I just don't see how the hell they get work because um, they have a generic <laughs> style that's really airy don't get me wrong I understand a lot of people like their highlights almost completely blown out I like colors I've always mm -hmm. thought colors look so much better. Now, when the sun's supposed to be bright and stuff like that, absolutely. But when you want to sit there, excuse me, you want to sit there and, like, have an image, my eyes are going to go more towards the ones where the colors are popping and more vibrant than the ones where I see this a dime a dozen at this point. Now, if it was everybody's colors pop, maybe I'd lean more towards the highlight situation. But I, I don't know. I like colors, and everybody wants their highlights. So that's sort of where I credit myself for it. Because while everybody's wanting the highlights, because, oh, it looks professional, it looks like this, I was <laughs> like, I don't really care about the highlights. I like the colors. I want to be able to see this really magenta color or I want to see the pores in the human skin. Highlights mm -hmm. is going to hide all of that. Uh, shadows, like you can't really get a lot of shadows. I like really good shadow work. Can't get shadow work if all your highlights are like overly blown out. Because then all the shadows look like, uh, for instance, how you have right now. You have raccoon eyes. Mm -hmm. To me, I probably look <laughs> like I have... I, I look like I probably have raccoon light eyes, which is what it's called when the, the face isn't really receiving a lot of light because yeah. the highlights are there. So the shadows are condensing more so here, like you have binoculars or you have raccoon eyes. Mm -hmm. And I came to find out the way you could hide that, especially without a flash, is instead of using the highlights, you use the shadows. So if I spread the shadows out, it looks more natural that, oh, the face just isn't supposed to be lit up at all and then all of the colors would pop out and so from that aspect that was more so it was like oh i'm really on something here let me keep going this and then finally and i was like well what's different well i mean they got good colors but their colors aren't really vibrant and i was like mm -hmm. that's all i want is vibrancy anybody can do vibrant anybody can do overly highlighted prod uh product it's more so a taste. And for me, I've always just liked colors while it seems like the rest of the world just likes highlights for some reason. 
not to say if you're listening and you do highlights, like blow out all your highlights, use less shadows and stuff. You're not wrong. It's just, it's an artistic taste and it's not for me. I've always just liked colors. So that's pretty much where like my style there went. I was going to say, and with your style, it definitely got a lot of color. I mean, some of your pictures, I remember, you know, you posted on Facebook and even the ones that you got on your Instagram. I mean, it's amazing work. So, I mean, for my listeners that haven't followed Alfred, uh, you guys have to. Uh, I'll make sure I put his uh, Instagram um, at, in the description for the video because, I mean, you do got some great work. And, I mean, I haven't got to see some of your short films yet. So, if you want to talk about some of your films, uh, I heard you say something about a Halloween one before. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, I uh, at this point, yeah, in the story, we can jump forward to the film aspect. At this point, I had completely put film on the back burner. And I was strictly doing photography. I thought that was a bad thing. I fell in love with photography. It helped feed me. It helped do a lot of stuff for me. Mm -hmm. um, the thing, the same one that threw me a bone for the concert tour, I kept telling people, oh, I'm going to make a movie. I'm going to make a movie. I'm going to make a movie. Mm -hmm. I guess you could say they either got tired of hearing me say I was going to make a movie or they sort of like called my bluff and pushed me off on it. They were mm -hmm. like, you know, nobody's going to give you money to make a movie unless you've already can show them what you do. The reason we gave you the opportunity to be a photographer all these times, you showed us how to take photos and that you can take photos. So mm -hmm. you got to do something. And it was kind of a kick in the gut. And I was like, you know what? He's right. So I sat there and I was like, this was June of 2016. Mm -hmm. June of 2016. I was like, well, I don't really know what I want to, like, what I can do. Easiest mm -hmm. thing that most people say when they start out, a lot of people that are low budget, they make horror films. Yep. Super easy. You can hide a lot of your mistakes. You can do a lot of this stuff. So I was like, okay. Well, I'll do a horror film uh, for for a project. Ended up getting to the screenwriting process, wrote uh, a project I called The Devil's Playground. I've let a couple of people read it. it. Wasn't my best work. I mean, it was decent. It was mediocre. I had a couple of people tell me it was mediocre. And I was like, well, I mean, it's not supposed to be an Oscar winner anyway. Uh, and plus, it's so, your first one, too. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've written a couple of screenplays at that point, but nothing, like, overly, overly serious. Mm -hmm. And uh, I set it to the side, and then middle of July, actually, no, it was a couple of days after the 4th of July, I believe, picked it back up, read it. I was like, oh, this is trash. So I, I was watching a movie, and lo and behold, it was the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> Classic. Uh, the original two, not the 2003, yeah, the one from 74. Mm -hmm. So I was watching it and it, it just dawned on me. I was like, dude, this was such a classic that genuinely scared people. But now it's just comedy tropes almost. Like if you were to take everything that happened in that film and apply it today. Like, I mean, you've seen it yourself. There's so many films where people are like, yo, that was really scary. I wonder if it holds up to the test of time. Well, no, it didn't hold up to the test of time. Nobody asks themselves why it doesn't. The reason it doesn't, for your listeners, everybody's doing it all the time. So the scare factor wears out. Like, jump scares are real nice because we don't expect it. Mm -hmm. Well, jump scares now really aren't scary because of the simple fact everybody, all they do is jump scares because that's the only type of actual scare they can do. They don't know how to write suspense anymore. They don't know how to do it. Now, somebody that actually does a company, Bloomhouse, absolutely love them. They're a small independent large thing they did stuff like the invisible man they did oh, hereditary that's, that's really good that's a good movie yeah they did hereditary they did um do, 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 do. hold on let's see what was that one? um do, 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 do. the uh, newest blair witch which was all right um mm -hmm. Funny with the Invisible Man, my actually my chiropractor 
last month was the one who actually suggested I watch it. So as she's doing my back, she's like, you got to check this movie out. It's really good. And I'm like, I, I didn't know what she was talking about at first. I thought she was talking about that one that was going um, in theaters. I'm like, are you talking about the one with the lady that has like this stalker? That's a video? She's like, no, 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 it's on Amazon. You got to watch it. It's so good. And yeah. She, yeah. she was right. Yeah, it was, was good. Uh, yeah, and that's actually uh, one of the top films, even though not many have been released this year. Of that came out this year, that I highly recommend uh, mm. for like just really good cinema. But um, so I sat there and I was like, okay, well let me let me see what I can do. I was watching the Texas Chainsaw, and originally I was like, you know what, I'm a I'm a redo the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I'm gonna do it in my way. I was like, I'm going to go back to the gritty realness of everything. Mm -hmm. And as I was doing it, I started realizing I was like, no, I'm falling into the comedy, or not the comedy, but the, the same tropes they do in major Hollywood films. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I need to stop what I'm doing and put myself as if this was in real life. So in the process of this being in real life, flipped the whole project from being scary to being a comedy. Mm -hmm. So the three Halloween skits I did, the one for 2016, 17, and 18, I tackled three different films that are major films. Uh, the first one was the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. First mm -hmm. project I ever did. Uh, I called it Texas Chainsaw in real life. The punchlines in it is the chainsaw ends up running out of gas because mm -hmm. any person with a chainsaw that's constantly revving it up in real life, that thing's going to be out of gas relatively quickly. Or well, not yeah. relatively quickly, but you're not going to have an endless gas supply, which mm -hmm. is where one of the punchlines in the film comes in play. And uh, he runs out of gas as he's about to kill the guy. Another punchline was the fact that the guy runs off while he's filling up the gas tank to the chainsaw because another comedy trope is let me just stand here frozen in terror mm. as my kill possible killer is getting ready to fix his mistake to kill me. Uh -huh. Okay, so <laughs> there's that. And that, I, that got played into it. And I even had the actor who played Leatherface shake his head like, damn, not again. Because <laughs> the dude just runs off. Man. All right. And then the final uh, trope that I, I hit was the fact that if a person is slowly walking to their prey, and this dude that is their prey is running away as fast as they possibly can, mm -hmm. the guy who's walking still isn't going to catch him. No. The guy who's walking is rapidly going to fall behind and the dude running away is going to get away. So I ended the film. The dude just sprints off as fast as he can mm -hmm. into the darkness while the guy with the chainsaw is just like, <sighs> and then goes back home. And that was literally all it was. Now, I, I don't recommend doing it, but what I ended up doing for the actual project was I self-financed the entire thing. We shot it in one day. It was a six-hour shoot. Well, really, it was a four-hour shoot, but a six-hour day. Mm -hmm. uh, it cost $5,000. I mm -hmm. took $5,000 of my own money, which taught me a lot about producing because a lot of people, when they think producing, especially in the music industry, they're like, oh, I just make the beats and sell the beats. Yeah. Is, <laughs> In film producing, you're, you're, you're putting up the money. You are putting up 100% of your money that you want to put into it. And chances are, you're, especially on the independent level, never getting that money back ever. Mm. So I put 5000 into it. <sighs> Didn't see a dime back. Um, but, I mean, I, I wouldn't trade it for the world because, like I said, it was a huge learning experience. Taught me how to budget, taught me all sorts of things. But I paid for catering for the night, so everybody 6D. I shot on actual cinema camera. I rented a high pocket pro cinema camera. Mm -hmm. um, super expensive, but to rent, it was only like three, $400 to rent it and all the camera lenses that I absolutely wanted. For it, I used a dude's truck. We paid somebody for the location of the house. We used a chainsaw. We used a couple of special effects. Um, so the five thousand dollars just got ate up. I mean, it, it is what it oh, is. Yeah. 
But um, in the process of doing all that, I thought it was going to be a simple, hey, man, we're only going to need the house for like at most an hour and a half just so I can do. No, no. Like I said, that thing turned into a four hour shoot, yeah. almost four and a half hour shoot. And uh, when it was all said and done, I kid you not, I had a hundred. Hold on. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. So all the data in my file that I'm looking at right now for that particular skit was 178 gigabytes of footage. The final product was two and a half minutes long. Wow. So <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not laughing, but I'm just the, the work that you put behind that. And you're like, and it was about two and a half minutes long. Like that is crazy. Yeah. I mean, talk about putting long. your heart and soul into, you know, your work, man. <laughs> yes. And when we, cause I, I did the rough cut, I, I w which is just, I take all the files and I put it together and I, I'm like, okay, the comedy, like how the punchlines are, they're not working here. So I trimmed it up a little bit and I was like, whoo, right there. That's where, where the punchlines was when it was finished. I saved it just like it was. Gave it to Terry McMillan. Uh, shout out to him. He's my editor for all three of those projects. He sat there, color graded, color corrected the thing. And when it was finished, I was so, so happy with the final product. Mm -hmm. Now, this was shot in August, so we had September to put the project together. I told them I didn't care if it won't finish by September, but I needed it finished by Halloween, the Friday before Halloween, because mm -hmm. all movies come out on Fridays, and I wanted my project, even though it wasn't a film, it was this comedy skit. I was like, I'd like my skit to come out the Friday before Halloween. So I think what happened was Halloween was a Monday that year. So I would have had that Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and then, of course, Monday being it. But I was like, we'll go ahead and put it out that Friday. Yep. Well, it took up until the second week, of, second week of October for it to be completely finished, and I was happy as could be with the project. So I sat there, and I was, like, uploading little snippets here and there when I was on Facebook, uh, just like teasing it, like, hey, I got something for you guys. You guys keep saying, oh, when you actually going to make something, I made something. I'm very proud of it. Mm -hmm. Released it the Friday before Halloween, and I didn't look at any of the views, didn't look at any of the comments or anything like that. I gave it one full week before I actually, actually looked at it. Mm -hmm. I had a total of 15 views, three comments. One person called it absolute trash, uh, and then the other two comments were like, hey, you really could do better here. But, yo, this is I, I, I genuinely laughed several times uh, in this project. Good work. Mm -hmm. Can't wait to see more from me. I didn't care about, oh, this was trash. I cared about the two positive comments because they told me in those comments mm -hmm. what could have worked better. But they said generally they got the idea. They enjoyed it. Oh, yeah. Then they were like. I can't wait for the next one. So at that point, it dinged off to me. That was a success. I thought I was getting two views, my dad, my mom, to view the project. And maybe they'd be like, good good, good luck, sweetheart, or some, some shit that, like that. You know? That's funny. That was my thought process with my podcast, too. I was like, yeah, yeah my mom, my dad, that's about it, probably. And then, yeah. boom, it popped. And I mean... Yeah. That's all you need is that one positive, like, momentum or person, yeah. and then the ball just continues to roll, man. I mean, that's great. Actually, um, where could where could we find this? Because, I mean, I don't think I've seen the, the video of it, but just from you describing it, man, it sounds like something I want to see, especially the him running out of gas like that. <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. Okay, so there is going to be another way you can view it because I'm no longer on Facebook, so once I – left Facebook, all of that technically got lost. Mm -hmm. I do have the finished file. I can send you the finished file if you would like. And anybody that, like you just linked my email to the description and whatnot, anybody that wants to see the finished project, I will gladly email it. It's big enough or it's not big enough. It's uh, it's in the size capacity for an email to be sent. It'll be compressed. Smoke looks kind of smudgy and stuff like that, but it is what it is. 
Um, I can gladly do that for any of the projects except for the last one. The last one would have to be like I uploaded to YouTube, which I might do uh, if enough people ask me for it. Um, I'm asking. Simply, let's do it, man. <laughs> but uh, through the process of all of that, I I I, um, I can do that. But I was in the mindset: if I can get ten views and one comment, I will consider that a financial success, and I will do another project. I got my my project received fifteen views in a week, and I was like, okay, well, I'll think of something else. Couldn't think of anything else except I got to follow it up. I didn't want to do a sequel, so I didn't do a Texas Chainsaw 2 in real life. I was like, I got to switch it up. I want to stay scary, but I got to switch up the formula a little bit. So when I switched the formula up the second time, fast forward a whole nother year, but this time I spent more time writing and everything. A lot of people know the Animeville horror. Mm -hmm. Okay. I wanted to put Animeville in real life again with my own comedy twist. So mm -hmm. I sat there and I had uh, a house in New York we rented for the night to shoot it. And we shot it in the process of three nights this time around. I spent roughly eight grand to make this work. Mm -hmm. uh, again, never saw any, any benefits whatsoever. I did have somebody help with the producing uh, they put, I think it was like $1,500 into it. So I was very happy with that. So when it was all said and done, it was almost a $10,000 comedy skit. Um, but when everything was finished, the way it was finished, we we sat there and uh, I, I took in the aspect that maybe what we'll do is, or what I will write is in real life, if I'm hearing voices in a house I just moved into, I'm moving the fuck out. I mean, any real person's going to do that the first night. I'm not going to oh, yeah. stay there. I'm, I'm not going to stay there and be like, oh, somebody told me to kill you, baby. Um, but whatever. Let's just stay in the house. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's just stay. <laughs> so I had three punch lines for the first one. I was mm -hmm. like, maybe we'll do three punch lines this time around. I ended up only doing uh, really one punch line. I focus more on atmosphere building with the music and stuff like that. So we took and I crafted the one big punchline. And then from the one big punchline, we pushed forward into a, another uh, section where I was like, okay, we have to make this work. Now, we can't really burn this person's house to the ground. So we got to find a way to make it work. Now, a lot of the finances for this project went into the special effects to make the house look like it was on fire. Mm -hmm. um, but I was like, so cinematography wise is where we're really going to focus a lot on the, this time around. Yeah. Uh, have you ever seen The Conjuring? The first Conjuring and the second Conjuring? I heard of them. I haven't watched them, though. My sister's actually a big fan of it. So shout out to her when she sees this. <laughs> okay. So there, and both of the Conjuring movies, there is a one shot, which is uh, for your viewers, is where the camera starts rolling and it doesn't stop rolling for the entire scene to play out. And the first movie, it's people moving into the house is the one shot. And as they're moving into the house, it, it's zooming around, it's moving around the house, but the camera never stops filming. Mm -hmm. One full take. Second one, it does the exact same thing. And if, I, if I'm if i not mistaken, the third one, whenever it does finally release, uh, it'll probably, because James Wan is a genius with how he does it. Mm -hmm. I wrote down in my notebook for that project, I was like, look, I want a one shot just like that. I don't care how hard it is. Uh, we were able to pull off uh, the one shot I wanted, but we, we were able to pull a one shot off and I was very happy for it. Um, but we were sitting there and we would, uh, I, I took and a lot of the stuff like people playing in the basement. I made jokes about that where it's like, yeah, I hear spooky sounds. I'm going to go play in the basement type thing. We did that. Uh, I made a smoke demon for the project. And from that, like a lot of people, I thought it looked totally like trash. Still to this day, I think it looks like trash. But at the end of the day, a lot of people were like, yo, no, that, that, that's pretty cool. With how you did the smoke demon. But the punchline for that film was, 
the the husband heard sounds of kill your family, kill your family. And he decides, okay, but I don't let you know this is what he does until the very end. He starts throwing gasoline all throughout the house. And then you see the fire in his eyes as the house is on fire and the camera pulls back and you see his whole family out there with him. And they were like, don't, do you think we went a little overboard? And he's like, nah, not at all. Because instead of, <laughs> oh, let me kill my family, fuck it, I'm just burn the house down type thing. True, true. That's the, that's the... Uh, so I did that. Mm-hmm. The third one wasn't necessarily scary. Mm-hmm. It was more of I wanted to focus on suspense. Mm-hmm. And with the suspense aspect, we went, uh, we went about it. Uh, I had a co-writer for it that helped with the idea. But And I still give Eric credit for it. Uh, but when it was all said and done, I ended up using a couple of his ideas, but I, I molded it into a project that I absolutely wanted it to look like myself. Mm-hmm. Um, he wanted aliens to come down and start abducting people because we chose Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind, or at least mm-hmm. I did. And I was like, I want the UFO. Uh, I want aliens. I want this. I want that. And rapidly that budget just kept going up and up and up and i was like oh shit i I can't afford this because the initial budget was like a hundred and twenty six thousand dollars around and i was like yeah i i I don't have that Mm -hmm. uh so i got three producers this time around um because the animeville actually out of all three of them became the most successful i had like six thousand views on facebook and a few hundred comments about it. So jumping from, yeah, so jumping from a few hundred views, I think the Texas Chainsaw had, before I took everything down, I think it had like roughly 200 views, something like that. The third, or this one had roughly like 4,000 views, I want to say, and uh, a, a few hundred comments. And this time around, there wasn't a lot of, yo, this is trash, except maybe pointing out the smoke demon. They were like, yeah, that smoke demon was kind of (laughs) weak. And I'm like, yeah, I understand that, but like, I don't have Hollywood budget money. So uh, I'm working with what I got, bro. And then, uh, but a lot of them were like, yo, this is really good. I appreciate it. So this time around, I had three people besides myself financing uh, this skit. And this skit ended up being when it was all said and done, all four of us put roughly $20,000 into the project. Oh, man. This must be a big project. It was two and a half minutes also. <laughs> Don't you just love, like, he put so much money, so much shooting, editing, and then it's like two and a half minutes. <laughs> yes. Uh, the Animeville was just short of five minutes, and it's not like I want really long projects either. Mm-hmm. I want it to work. To if it's going to be a long project, I want it to be long because it's meant to be long. Oh, I don't yeah. want it to be long and then people be like, "Yo, dude, this thing should have ended thirty seconds. This thing should have ended a minute, two minutes beforehand." A lot mm-hmm. of people even told me they were like, "Yo, the way I did the Animeville project, they were like." bro, you could have went like 10, 15 minutes into this thing and like really built up the atmosphere. And I was like, yeah, but I don't have 10, 15 minutes of extra time, money and things like that because you guys don't realize this costs 10 grand to Mm -hmm. really make. And And so... I'm glad you're you're breaking that down too because people think that, oh, let me just grab a camera, maybe hire a couple, you know, actors or something, get a light and film away and it's like no i mean it takes time it takes money it takes writers actors i mean and i'm glad you're breaking it down showing like hey this stuff's expensive it costs a lot and not only that just time money but in the finished product it's not even going to be like your typical hour and a half two hour movie you're going to get you know absolutely nice film. and and like but to do that, now there have been, uh, like, for instance, the young girl that was in the anime video project, Emily, I'm actually talking to her about other stuff later on down the road. She actually, uh, at the time, because she was actually a member of the Screen Actors Guild, 
So instead of actually paying full price for her, which was like $2,200, she worked a deal out with me where she was like, look, my family's got to be here anyways, because I'm under the age of 16. Mm -hmm. Uh, At the time, I think she was like right at 13, maybe she was 14. She was like, uh, my family's got to be here anyways on set because we don't know you uh, and things of that nature. They were like, she said, as long as you feed me, you feed them and you pay for the gas that it takes to get out here. I'll do it the whole project for a hundred bucks. I was like, oh, OK. So I gave her a hundred bucks. And then, of course, it was the three days of feeding her and her family probably was like an extra hundred bucks, 200 bucks. Um, and then the gas was like a hundred bucks in itself. So I basically spent $500 for an actress mm-hmm. versus the full 22, almost $2,300 that she would normally cost. Oh yeah. So there are people who will work with you in that aspect. And then you got some people who are just like, yo, I really want to work with you, but I'm $15,000. Mm-hmm. And then you're like, I don't have fifteen thousand dollars, and they're like, I don't care. I need fifteen thousand dollars, and it's like, well, I don't have fifteen thousand uh, dollars to pay you, so we we can't do we 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 just can't work. It sucks, but we just can't work. Mm-hmm. And through that process, uh, I have lost a couple of people project wise that way. So I mean, it, there, there's definitely a lot that goes into uh, all of it, but the good people that in my opinion, are really going to excel, whether it be independent or studio wise, are the ones who will sit there and be like, hey, this is what I normally cost, but we can work out a deal to some Mm -hmm. sort. Uh, Maybe like if, for instance, if I sell the project, uh, they're like, yo, if you sell it, give me points on the back end. So for every dollar, maybe I get 10 cents on the dollar, 15 cents on the dollar. Oh, yeah. uh, producers, they're always like, look, as long as I can get some of my money back, if you sell it, I don't care what I get back. If I get $10 back, I get $10 back. If I get nothing back because you didn't sell it, but we still see it as a success, I'm fine with that. Success mm-hmm. is where it is. And that's something for anybody who wants to like truly go into film. That's something I recommend you accepting right here and now. The first, the never expect to be financially, uh, especially in the independent circuit, never expect anything back. Otherwise, you're you're going to be heartbroken and you're going to realize that maybe this isn't for you. Uh, Me, it's like I was telling everybody because everybody was always asking me, well, you don't make no money. How can you keep doing it or wanting to do it? I enjoy telling the stories. I don't care if I never make any profit off of it. And still to this day, I don't care. I used to be like, oh, I want to make Hollywood films. Now I don't really care necessarily about the Hollywood film aspect of it. If I could get some budget like that, I'd be happy. But I'm not really necessarily worried about getting uh, even the budget because I got people who will help produce and with each project I have more people interested in producing and helping produce which means more money into the project as well uh and with all of that um I I just straight up I recommend if it's something you won't understand it's not going to go the way you want it to go and you're going to Definitely be putting a lot, a lot of money into it before you even remotely see any outcome. That's that's awesome, man, that you, you know, took the time to break that down. And you're actually this is one of my favorite quotes where it's like, you know, do it because you love it and then the money will come later. Or even if it doesn't come, at least you're doing it because you love it, you know, because success or satisfaction, there's really no, you know, price on that, you know doing what you just love, you know, and you are like literally the, the walking example of that, man. So, you know, continue going strong. I wish you a lot of success when, you know, doing it. But like you said, you don't care if you make Hollywood films or if you're just doing your independence. I mean, as long as you're happy, that's really what matters, man. And I think everyone, all my viewers should definitely take that to uh, the heart. Do what makes you happy. Absolutely. Because uh, like I said, at this point, 
I I've been doing film. I guess you could say it's October now for four years. And out of four years, I've done well. Yeah, four years, and I've done three projects that I've released to the public in those four years that I'm very satisfied with. Never got any income off of them. I got really nice connections with people through them. Mm. And a uh, couple of them are working on uh, this next idea I'm kicking around. It's not a Halloween skit because for me, the Halloween skits are over. Um, uh, I did it as a nice little trilogy of Halloween skits in real life. The re- In real life uh, trilogy is what I call those skits. Uh, maybe one day I'll, I'll touch on them, some skits again like that or whatnot. But right now, I'm very satisfied with what I got out of those. And the way I view them as a financial success is the fact that I got more views. I'll never disclose what my view count for those particular things are because I shoot myself very low. Um, I just I consider the Animeville, uh, I consider it a massive success. Because I was, like I said, low views. I expected, like I said, mom and dad for the first one. The second one, I was expecting like 30-something-ish. And then uh, the last one, I was expecting like four or five, pretty much. I mean, mm-hmm. just roughly. And then to, to actually get the numbers that I was getting off of those. And then the fact that people were engaging with me about the projects and some people asking, Hey, the next thing you do, I want to do that. I considered mm-hmm. that the financial success versus mm-hmm. me being able to bring money home type type situations on that. I, I, I understand completely, man. Cause like just the success from my first episode, I had so many people hit me up. Oh man, I would love to be on your show, man. That'd be great. So like, and I, I literally expect to maybe get one guest per month. I'm booked till like the end of November already. And I'm like, hey. I'm just loving it, man. I'm just like, damn, this is just a blessing, man. Like, I, like, like, just like you, man, I'm the same way. I set the bar like kind of low only because like the life I've, I've had, I've kind of been through some like let down. So I'm like, if I yeah. set it low, maybe I won't be so let down, but then it's like, when it exceeds your expectations, it's like, oh shit, like I gotta keep going. I gotta keep doing this. Like, this is great. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like, it's, it's almost like, you know, a, like, you know, compared to a drug, but it's like your drug, like, holy shit, like it's something I actually like doing. People yeah. actually like it. What? Oh man, let me yeah. continue. Yeah. So that's amazing. Yeah. But let's, let's touch on um, your martial arts background, man, because like, you know, that, that blew me away too, because I'm a big like fight fan, man. Like, I love MMA. UFC, I mean, and you do too, because I remember posting some things or um, asking about like uh, Connor and stuff, and you just break it down and you know let yeah. me know things. But like, what got you interested in it? Or let me rephrase that: where where did you start? Like, did you just one day say, "Hmm, I might want to try that," or you know, where did you where do you train at? <clears throat> okay, so out of Sanford, Tamabu areas. Uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is the affiliate, but Team Abu is the actual location. It's uh, it's in Sanford. Um, so shout out to Professor Tanya, Coach Brad, Coach Bill. Uh, they do wonderful work. Mostly it's Jiu-Jitsu, but we do have fighters that are amateur and fighters that are professional that are out of the gym. And we have work camps, if you will, where when they have fights coming up, we still do jujitsu, but that's also where we focus on striking and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, For those that are interested, not everybody's interested. Work camps are usually four or five of us. And we either just beat the hell out of each other or submit Mm -hmm. each other type situations like that. Uh Um, But I didn't personally start mix anything martial art wise i always wanted to do like after i was younger and watched the karate kid time back in the movies like i said film film's huge in my life uh Uh, i always wanted to do karate but my mom never wanted me to fight or anything of that nature she was like ah that's there's no point in that there's no point in that mm -hmm. and i can't lie as i grew up i sort of had a chip because i've always been small um even today i weigh a hundred and 30 ish pounds. I've always been small, small and I've been tall, lanky, 
not a lot of weight. People always telling me to eat, even though I can out eat them type thing. <laughs> um, and so, uh, to put it simple, I had an ego, so, or not necessarily an ego, but I, I had an, in, a lot of people from. had a lot of people have a uh, ego and uh, a uh, superiority complex. I had an in superiority complex i've always looked down on myself i've always thought damn i, I mean i'm 25 I'm, I'm losing my hair at 25 this that yada yada and really mm -hmm. downplaying myself and um uh so i was i was in that situation and i always wanted to like try and do that because i had a lot of anger built up and everything like that but my mom never would let me do anything even remotely close to that mm -hmm. and um she, she like really sheltered me and uh so I was in middle school and like people were always doing like the bathroom slap boxing boxing type stuff that especially, everybody especially at was <laughs> yeah yeah uh and so like I wanted to try and do that but I was like man these guys they beat the shit out of me I ain't even worried about it uh, there was one time in middle school that I genuinely thought like, hey, I'm going to have to fight somebody. But I was scared to even throw a punch almost because of the simple fact like the moment I hit these guys, I can hit them one time. Then they're just going to beat the living crap out of me. I don't know anything of that nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something I don't really open up a lot on is like I, I somewhat did experience a little bit of bullying, which I think just added to the inferiority complex I had. Mm -hmm. And through that, it just made me matter, 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 and mm -hmm. matter. And then finally, I started watching, because uh, me and my neighbor, who's one of my best friends that I consider my brother, shout out to Dakota Jeffries, uh, we would used to like wrestle on the trampoline, like WWE stuff. And mm -hmm. it kind of like broke my heart as I got older, because people were like, you know, that's fake as hell, right? And I was like, uh. nah, nah. <laughs> It bro, can't be fake. I'm, I'm still yeah. low-key a fan, and it still breaks my heart to accept it. I try to be like, oh, it's not fake. It's 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 scripted, <laughs> or it's uh, uh what did I say? Oh, it's fixed. It's, it's not it's not fake. It's fixed. You know, that's yeah. just the fan in me. But so I, I know what it is. <laughs> I, I, I sat there and I would do that, and the reason I like that is because like I I uh, my dad used to watch boxing, and. In the boxing, you know how it is. It's just punches. And I was like, well, that's really cool and all, but like, excuse me, but I'm like, uh, I don't really care because, I mean, what if you kick them? What if you do this? What if you pick them up and throw them on the ground type mm -hmm. of thing? No, you can't do that. It's just punches. Well, yeah, if you punch better than I punch, you're going to beat me. I got to have some way to sit there. And they were like, well, that's where our footwork comes in. And I just found it really boring. While in WWE, mm -hmm. I take a chair, boom, I do this, I do that. Uh -huh. I do. And I was like, yeah, woo. And then finally, I was under the impression, I just found, because like I said, I was uh, when I was younger, I found boxing kind of boring. And to a point, yeah. won't lie, still find boxing kind of boring. Now, there are some boxers who make it worthwhile, yeah. um, but... I still, to a point, find it extremely boring. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and so I was sitting there, and I was like, well, how do y'all say wrestling's fake? But then I was like, but it's an Olympic sport. And then I found out, well, that's technically amateur wrestling. And I was like, well, if that's amateur, like, I'm not understanding. Mm -hmm. These guys are pro wrestlers. Shouldn't they be the ones doing it? And then, of course, <laughs> which still to this point, kind of baffles me and I'm, I'm I'm just like okay whatever I had finally I just kind of like you know this is a good a couple years ago I was like I'm gonna end up like doing something that like I'm not very okay with and uh I I need to not necessarily say like oh I'm gonna shoot up a school it's just when it comes to confrontation I'm not really good with confrontation mm -hmm. and somebody gets in my face I'm like at one point I might snap and act you not you're just yelling at me I might accidentally actually hit you so I need a way to blow out steam. So I searched around. This was back in late 18, early 19. We'll mm -hmm. say that. 
uh, like I fiddled around with a couple of things here and there, but I was like, eh, I need a gym that's closer instead of me driving an hour and some change away. Luckily, mm-hmm. Team Abu popped up, and that's primarily where I've been training for a while. Um, I, I injured my foot, so I had to take a, a long absence of leave, so I'm slowly breaking myself back in, so uh, I ain't overdoing the thing uh, things with my foot and re-injuring myself. But uh, it was through there. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to do jiu-jitsu. Just try jiu-jitsu because I started watching some of the MMA fights. And I was like, see, now this is fake. And then people were like, no, this is the real stuff that you want. (laughs) And so I started watching and I was like, oh, wow, this is like WWE for real. But like, hold up, let me see this. And then I started watching more and more of it. And I started getting some favorite fighters. Like I was there for uh, Brock Lesnar when he transitioned over back and forth. I was like, see, y'all can't tell me WD, uh, WWE's <laughs> fake because he does it in both. What a hell of a and, time that was, man. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, through all of that, finally we sat there and me and my stepdad, we watched uh, – some fights at one point and I was like yo this is really cool when I was younger but I never was really interested in fighting well Mm -hmm. when I decided I needed to blow off the steam uh I went in and then it was me against somebody else and then of course the inferiority complex kicks in I was like okay well we're both white belts but this dude's easily easily got 60 70 pounds on me plus he's like four inches taller than me Mm -hmm. I got smashed and the first day of jiu-jitsu, I kid you not, is the best. If you have any type of complex, whether it's uh, superiority, inferiority, if you have an ego, anything like that, it's good to bring it in for one day. You step on the mat because you get put in your place rather quickly. Maybe not so much in my eyes uh, for people who have inferiority complexes because then they're like, well, damn, I knew I was going to get the shit beat out of me. Why do I need to continue to get the shit beat out of me? But I was like, I know for a fact I can beat this dude. And that's, but that I think came from the fact that like I have an ego complex when you put a camera in my hand. I'm the best photographer there ever is type thing. So I don't know. It it just, I was like, if I figured this out, I can beat this dude. Mm -hmm. So I kept coming back and back and back and back and back. And slowly I started realizing, yo, I'm actually getting pretty good at this. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when it goes from the jujitsu, which jujitsu is a beautiful art, I was like, this works, but I need some type of striking. Mm -hmm. And at that point they were like, well, we got this, we got this. And there was a couple of the low level pros uh, for those that don't know, just because you're a pro fighter doesn't mean you fight for the UFC. There's small (laughs) regional circuits guys. And they do the exact same stuff you see on the UFC and Bellator and one fighting it's just right now they don't have the social draw. Maybe they aren't physically like where they need to be type thing. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, there, there's, there's a lot of pro fighters out there, guys. Uh, tons, tons. <laughs> and then, uh, so I was working a fight camp with a couple of our middle tier pro fighters we got. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they were getting in fight camp and I was like, well, I really kind of need to know how to strike because, yeah, I can throw a jab. Yeah, I can throw a cross and a couple of hooks. Mm-hmm. But like, I don't know form. I don't know how to block. I don't know how to do any of this shit. Mm-hmm. And just as I expected, the first day I got picked apart mm-hmm. and I was like, all righty then. But the one thing that worked to my benefit was when it did get to the ground, at that point, I had jujitsu, So I started working around, got a couple of submissions and stuff like that. And people were like, yo, you got a really nice guillotine, which still to this day, like I have a guillotine. People have told me if I want somebody's neck, I can get their neck without even trying, which I can. And that's not even trying to like sit there and boast that about me. Everybody, when you talk about, you go to the gym, everybody's got like a go-to move sometimes. People are like, if you go against Al, watch out for the guillotine. Whatever you do, do not give that man your neck. Don't even come near him with your neck. He's going to find your neck, and he's going to guillotine you. 
Mm -hmm. um, whether it's a standing guillotine, a flying guillotine, if you put me on my back, I still choke you out guillotine. Now, I'm not saying I get it every single time, mm -hmm. uh, but my success rate, I, I, I feel like it suffers 70% success rate with a guillotine. If I get your neck, there's a good chance I'm going to finish the neck. But uh, so I started working with Coach Brad, who uh, shout out to him. He's actually in the military and he does a lot of the army combatives type stuff. So learning a little bit of this, learning a little bit of that. Uh, then, of course, I started picking up a little bit of Muay Thai here and there that it slowly got molded into Muay Thai. Okay. And, um, and then I was like, OK, so I'm going to mix the Muay Thai with the Jiu Jitsu and everything like that. And now, of course, like you were saying, I was telling you earlier, we had a bunch of killers at the gym today, so it was a nice little MMA sparring session. So we're there. But uh, I did my first uh, jiu-jitsu competition. Uh, it was Veterans Day of last year. So I had only been training a couple of months. And uh, my weight class, uh, I didn't think there would be a lot of people in my weight class. So I actually packed on 10 pounds. All day, every day, chicken, 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 protein, chicken, protein <laughs> shakes, protein shakes, large amounts of calories. At night, I would sit there and buy uh, like pizzas and cook pizzas in the oven that were like uh, 2,000 calories. If you were to say the whole pizza was 2,000 calories and I would just eat that nonstop. I'd lay in bed on my days off. I wouldn't do anything just so I could pack on weight and I packed on right at it was, I want to say it was like eight pounds. I was two pounds under of the, uh, under the 145 range. And crazy thing is, is there was still nobody in my weight class. There was somebody that would have been in my weight class had I not made or put on any weight. Uh, there was one person and then there was another person in the weight class under there. So they all folded up into um, the 145 range. So you had a 125 or a 135 -er, and then me at 145 and it was just a three man tournament between us. I took second. So with my silver medal, I genuinely feel like, oh, okay, I really did medal because yeah, I, I personally think it would have like, I think it would have bothered me had I lost both matches and I still got the bronze medal. Cause I'd be like, but I lost both. I'm not really, I don't really think mm -hmm. this, this holds any weight. Uh, but I took second. I lost the first one by points. I did really good until I made a mistake um, where I tried to push uh, or break guard. And when I, I was trying to break his guard, uh, I lost balance. And then, of course, he swept me. And then he couldn't finish me. So all he did was just do all sorts of transitions to get the points. And so when it was said and done, I ended up losing uh, losing the first match. In, in time due to uh to points and then the second match uh was the only one that i was really worried about uh which is crazy because i was like oh the guy i'm not worried about is the guy i know i can beat and i ended up losing to him so i was like well damn i'm gonna I definitely know i'm gonna lose <laughs> never, to the never guy underestimate that your opponent right <laughs> yeah so i was like well i definitely know i'm gonna lose to the guy that i'm really worried about and in the process of all of that uh, I, I kind of zoned out and then he shot for a takedown. I stopped the takedown. And then something that me and Professor Tanielle have been working on is an anaconda choke. So it's oh. where I go from a sprawl, I shoot the arm up around the neck through the armpit, and then I lock in and then I put my head back and then I, I rotate, roll us and like how a snake. Franklin. And while I was doing that, uh, so while I was doing all of that, um, I sat there and I went to roll and he had wrestling background. I don't know why I tried to roll. He just dropped all his weight on me, stopped it, stopped me. And so I was sitting there still trying to finish it, still trying to finish the, uh, the anaconda choke. I could hear Professor Tanya, go, 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 go. 
and finish the choke. And then I hear people, ow, you need to breathe, bro. Breathe, breathe. <laughs> I'm turning red trying to finish the choke. Mm-hmm. And finally, I just let the choke go and he put me in side control. And uh, I was like, damn, I'm going to lose this one because I was just exhausted. And finally, I was able to recover my guard relatively easily and quick because all I heard was, recovered the guard. So I, I sat there, I, I bridged up, I pushed him, wrapped my legs around him to recover the guard. And for some reason, I was like, go for a scissor sweep, which is where I pull you down, I tape one of my legs and push your legs out, and then I take the other leg and push your body over. So instead of your body being like this, I flip you over like this to where I'm on top. Mm-hmm. Well, as I'm shooting to start the scissor sweep, I hear Professor Tanya, no, don't do it. So I stop what I'm doing, and as I'm dropping, I don't, I don't know what I was thinking when I did it, but I shot my left leg over his body, isolating his uh, left arm, no, his right arm and his neck, and I threw the other leg above to start the foundation of my triangle, and I started pulling on the head, and I had the triangle really nice, but he wasn't tapping. And another thing that just like instinctively came to me was if I put him on his side, it doesn't matter if I can't choke him out. Like he can't move at all. So I took, released one hand off the triangle, shot the arm up under his leg, then came pulled. And as the leg was coming up to his face, he fell over. Uh, I can send you the video of that as well. Oh, uh, definitely, man. <laughs> he, he sat there, he fell over. And next thing I know, I had so much power to like squeeze them together with the triangle choke. Mm-hmm. I just felt them tap. I let go. And in the process of that, I still wasn't breathing. So when I let go, I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> and then as I'm sitting there moving around, getting up and everything, I was like, bro, I am exhausted. <laughs> I am exhausted. And they were talking about I would have to go against the guy in the first match again. And I sat there and looked at my uh, Professor Tanyel, and I was like, I don't have another one in me. My cardio is <laughs> shit, bro. <laughs> so uh, uh, luckily, I did that. I took home second at uh, Ranger Up, because uh, the Ranger Up second grappling uh, classic. So shout out to the Ranger Up brand, because they're doing really cool things. Um, and then I went, like I said, I did that shortly foot so from i want to say july of last year until recently i'm I, i've been recovering my right foot first i uh i had a, a stress fracture and bone contusion now all it is is a contusion of the bone still the fracture is healed pretty much as good as it can be so certain things i'm working with there uh like i can kick but if I kick just right and then I put too much pressure on the foot, I still feel the sting on the con- where the contusion is, I guess you could say. Mm. And so I, I'm, I'm still babying my foot, but I, we're working with it. We're working with it because I definitely want to compete again, and I definitely want to get a couple of uh, matches in as well awesome, uh, for man. MMA. So. I, I can't wait till you compete, man. I definitely want to check you out, man. And who knows, maybe we can do like a post-fight or a pre-fight interview too with that. Hey, that would, that would be pretty dope. That'd be pretty. It, it definitely will, man. So um, as we uh, continue to talk about your MMA, like it seemed like you got um, jujitsu pretty down pat. Which one was the hardest to like really like adapt to? It Was it the Muay Thai was the striking? Did you uh, put your hand in wrestling a little bit? Like, which one was, like, the hardest to, like, grasp? Well, wrestling, we sort of incorporate just like we sort of incorporate judo for jiu-jitsu because jiu-jitsu is a combination of takedowns, submissions, and basically wrestling for the better position. Mm-hmm. Uh, jiu-jitsu, honestly, I would say is the harder one to grasp just because it's so crazy how the body functions. I can put you in a certain like arm bar and it might not hurt you, but you put me in the exact same thing. I'm tapping out just because body mechanics are different. Mm -hmm. But I will say when it comes to the striking aspect for MMA, somebody who's never had any striking experience like myself, 
it was hard. I'm, but it's hard because you got to gain the confidence aspect, in my opinion. Um, and with all of that, I still say it's harder for me to learn striking, maybe because I haven't done striking as much. But I found striking harder because I'm a small dude, so I don't think my punches are going to hurt. I was more worried about the proper form. Uh, It's can I get in there in the pocket, hit them, and then get out the pocket without getting hit? If I get in the pocket, can they stop me too many times? Can I do this? And it's thinking too much when really it's I got to do this, I got to do that instead of how I am doing it where it's, damn, I got to do this, but not do this, 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 nah, (laughs) the striking aspect. But if you go into it and you have a little bit of, I would say, striking experience of any sort, probably jujitsu would be harder. Because like I said, you got to learn body mechanics. I mean, certain positions, you're like, bro, my body can't do that. And next thing you know, your body can do it. It just takes time for your body to adapt to it. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, like I'm thinking I, of some, some some submissions that my big self were trying to do. Like I, I always wanted to attempt to do an omoplata, but I'm like, I'm way too damn big. <laughs> but I mean, like you said, the body mechanics, though, I mean, I probably can do it. I just got to get used to it. Absolutely. Uh, omoplata is a good one. That was one of the first things I learned uh, when I started jujitsu is a lot of people know the omoplata simply as the finishing move uh, for the submission where it's like a uh, shoulder lock, sort of. Uh, But a lot of people don't realize you actually can do an omoplata sweep. So you're standing up. I can get the start of the omoplata and sweep you, get the points for the sweep, and then finish with the omoplata. Or if you're sneaky and able to get out the omoplata, all I do is just reach over and I got your back for the rear naked choke. True. So um, going back to your your striking, so like – um, what are you? Uh, what, like, what's your stance? Are you like soft, uh, soft ball? Or are you orthodox? Like, or are you just well, trying to kind of figure it out? Uh, still? Uh, well, boxing is definitely orthodox. MMA, you don't want an actual, uh, you don't want a stance, and the reason being is because you are switching stances too much. In boxing, you don't have people switching stances. What you see is what you get. Mm -hmm. Uh, you want to be able to be fluid in both orthodox and being a southpaw with Muay Thai, with MMA, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kickboxing, I think that still relies a lot on uh, if you're an orthodox person or a southpaw. But boxing is primarily, if I'm not mistaken, the only thing that genuinely like focuses on, okay, are you a southpaw or are you orthodox? Okay. So, um, damn, I was about to ask you something. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, um, favorite fighter, like, of all time. I mean, we, you know, different eras and stuff, but of all time, like, someone you could you can go on YouTube or pop in a video and just watch their film, break it down, try to emulate them. Like, who is your favorite all-time uh, mixed martial artist? Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor? <laughs> I-, I love Conor, too. I'm not going to lie, man. That dude is uh, funny. And it's – There's more to why I like Connor than a lot of people think. Connor is a bad man, and he will always go down in history as a bad man. But the reason I prefer Connor McGregor as my favorite fighter of all time is because he is undoubtedly the GOAT for mixed martial arts. He doesn't have the best record. Habib Nurmagomedov beat him. He's got the best record. There's so many people with better records than Connor. None of them did what Connor did, though. Connor elevated prices of fighters. Fighters. Not as much as they probably should make, but they, I mean, they still make a lot of. Um, He's brought so much attention to the sport in itself. When you hear people talking about, oh, I like watching fights. Well, who got you into fights? Well, Connor, he, he talks a lot of trash, yada, yada, yada. Connor, I like when Connor fights. Mm-hmm. Uh, Connor has given them the biggest numbers they've ever seen. True. Uh, the only person that comes close, I think they said, was like Lesnar, but Connor still 
is like John, well john jones john jones does a lot of numbers as well true, uh jo true, yeah. jones israel adesanya who shout out to him had a great fucking fight against paulo costa this, oh, uh, like two weeks ago yeah a, man. he's the next anderson silva to me he's the next well, anderson if not I, better I, I like his approach to it because uh, people do call him the next Anderson Silva, and his approach is um, he's like, I like the comparisons. Right now the comparisons are fine, but when my career is as far along as his career is, I don't want to be the next Anderson Silva. I want people to say I want to be the next Israel Adesanya. He yeah. wants to – he wants to – and he has the opportunity to excel past Anderson Silva. They sort of passed the torch during their fight, and I'd love to see another fight. I know Anderson Silva even came out and said he'd like to fight Izzy, even if it's not for the title, but just fight Izzy again straight up. I mm. think that would be wonderful. Um, but Israel has always said he wants to be the next level above. That way people will be like, all right, I want to aspire to be like Israel Asanya. So another Israel Asanya is like, okay, I appreciate the comparisons to Izzy, but I want to be the next one, he said. And I agree, because that is how the next couple of levels, like, excel, and you get extremely, extremely good fighters. Mm -hmm. I mean, shoot, fighters have came a long way, because I actually, being, a, you know, a big wrestling fan, as we talk, the first time I was ever introduced to, like, mixed martial arts was from Ken Shamrock, him, Dan Severn from way back in, like, the early 90s and stuff. And then I slowly started watching it, because it wasn't as big until, like, Ultimate Fighter just blew up. Then I started watching. I fell in love with guys like Sean Shirk, GSP, Josh Koscheck. Uh, GSP and Anderson Silva was always my favorites for a long time. Rampage as well. But these new breed of fighters are crazy, man. Like like you are saying, like, they're just setting the bar high. Like, it's like, it's like the fighters I grew up watching. I don't even know if they can hang with some of these fighters now. Like, who's your favorite up-and-coming fighter? Up and coming, up and mm -hmm. coming. Uh, Bryce Mitchell, shout out to him. Second ever twister in UFC history. Mm -hmm. um, Bryce Mitchell's really good. People hating on him. I love me some Sugar Sean. Yeah, he took a loss. Yeah, the way he's handling situations right now where he still says he's undefeated. He's got a wonderful mindset. I like that. He's like, I didn't think I got beaten. He just, my, 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 my leg fucked up and he's like he didn't gin I mean he beat me judge wise he beat me and rule wise but he didn't genuinely beat me True. and up until the moment where his foot like failed him and the match was over regardless even if it would have went to the next round I guarantee you Herb Dean wouldn't have let the fight continue because of the way his foot was in the first place oh, yeah. uh, but until his foot got messed up I still think he was piecing together Cheeto Vera. Uh, I, I think Cheeto uh, was pretty much didn't have an answer for any fucking thing that Sugar was giving him in that last fight. So, and then even when his foot was messed up, like he still was putting power and shit into it. He was like, okay, I can't throw mm -hmm. kicks like I want to, kind of throw punches and shit. And then, uh, my only concern when that fight was happening, I was like, oh, okay, okay, he, he's, he's going to get back. He's going to get back. My only concern was when he started having to circle around the cage. I was like, okay, no, something yeah. really is wrong. And then, of course, he fell. And Cheeto – and then, like, the crazy thing about Cheeto was Cheeto jumped up and he was acting like, oh, I beat the hell out of this uh, man. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah. I was like, bro, you, you got a couple of elbows in. He was clearly defending, like, the fight, even if – that like last what was it 11 12 seconds played through fight when it went to the second round anyway i personally feel because i think herb would have been like dude you can't continue you can't put nothing on that foot mm -hmm. um but i'm glad there was like no real major injury to it uh and hopefully i know he was talking about he, he's trying to get another fight for the, the december card which Low key, I'm hearing Dustin Poirier and Conor McGregor might be fighting again on the December card, which oh. I think that that would be sick. I'm definitely because when Conor said back in January he wanted to fight like three more times this year, mm -hmm. like I was like, yo, this is the Conor that we I like enjoyed watching because everybody saw Conor when he was starting out, and then you go from where he was 
or well, not necessarily starting out, but like well, he made his debut when he, with the when UFC. He made it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And everybody's like, okay, well, once he knocked out Jose Aldo, everybody was like, yo, it's all about Connor. No, I, the first time I got introduced to Connor was when he became double champ for Cage Ward. Uh, Cage Ward. Oh, so you're going Cage way Ward? back. Uh-huh. Yeah, like right before he got signed to. Yeah. I mean, I, so like, it's not like, oh, I'm a dick writer or anything like that. Like, no, I, I saw him when it was like, oh, this is the first dude trying to attempt to have two belts at the same time. Let's mm-hmm. see how this works. Yo, this works. Then, oh, he's going to the UFC. Okay, let's see if he really about that. And then, first round finish. I was like, bro, okay. Dust, who was it? Dustin Poirier next. Then it was Max Holloway, and then it was that's it that's just, when I started watching with the Max Holloway fight, where I was like, holy shit, like because Max Holloway, that dude's tough. And I was like, Connor was just eating him up, and I'm like, man, this dude McGregor's pretty damn good. Yes, yes. And and I do admit, like his his ground game was his weakest part, if I'm not mistaken. Still, to me, I think his ground game could use a work. I, I understand he's a brown belt under uh, John Cavanaugh, but his and it has improved. Like his fight with Cerrone, first thing Cerrone yeah. did, Connor went for uh, for his famous left straight, and then uh, people were sitting there and like they downplay it so much how quick he threw that straight as Cerrone goes for the takedown, but he stops the straight and stops the takedown and mm-hmm. then works his way up and starts throwing them shoulders. And I was like, bro, that, that, that's, that is true. Absolute wildness. And I was um, so hyped for that fight too. Well, I, was, I was too. I, and I and people it. asked me, uh, people were asking me the night of the fight, the week leading up to the fight. Do you really think Connor still has it? And I was like, we'll find out in this fight. If Connor is the Connor that he's showing he is, I was like, there's no doubt he wins. And there's no doubt that, like, if he stays with this mindset, I wouldn't say he'd fight Nargamedov again by the end of the year. But I was like, within a year, year and a half, I guarantee he fights Nargamedov and gives him a legitimate chance at, like, losing. Um, and then, of course, Everybody's like, well, how do you know uh, what Connor you're getting? And I was like, well, you just got to watch. I like watching the UFC embedded series. Um, mm-hmm. They release videos on YouTube and they do all that stuff of the week of the fight, showing what fighters are doing and everything, which I, I find that fascinating. In Same. fact, that's actually uh, what one of my new ideas I, I, I'm flirting around with is sort of somewhat in that uh, general vicinity, but um. Hey, there we go. Plug, plug it away, man. Go ahead. Let us know. Uh, Get the exclusive well, yeah. drop on the people's <laughs> choice. <laughs> but uh, but I was sitting there and um, I was just watching the Embedded series and he's genuinely in training. He's genuinely like focused and everything like that. I was like, the night of the fight, I was like, guarantee you this don't make it out the second round. 40 seconds. 40 seconds. Hey, I was, was like... That surprised the heck out of me because I, I grew up watching Cowboy and I mean, I seen him in WEC, I seen him, you know, his rise in UFC. And I was like, damn, man, he got like a hell of a reach on Connor, though. I'm like, and, and he knows how to mix it up. I'm like, oh no, I think Connor could win, but it's going to be tough. And like I said, 40 seconds, I said, holy shit. <laughs> yeah. And, and the crazy thing is, I still think it went like 10 seconds too long. Mm. Uh, like as soon as he sat there and did the uh, the fake left to the left head roundhouse kick and like wobbled Cerrone and then he put his hand up and he started firing his punches. Mm-hmm. As soon as you see Cerrone caving in, that in my opinion that was it. I appreciate. I think it was Herb Dean that refereed that match, giving uh, Cerrone the opportunity to like try and defend. But the moment he was like cradled up and he was like trying to spin out of it at that point, beating the hell out of him. So I think it was like easily a 10 second too long. I mean, not that it like certainly received super damage from it or anything like that. I mean, his nose got broken, orbital bone fractured or something like that. But I mean, what do I know? Right. What do I know? But I know, right. So, hey, Alfred, so are you uh, you ready for some uh, mailbag questions we got from um, let's, our listeners? All right. Yes, sir. So, let's, let's roll. All right. So I'm going to start this one off. Uh, I know we touched on it just a little bit earlier. This one comes from Daniel. He says, 
after high school, it looked like you was on tour with a band that seemed pretty cool. I was curious on that topic. Can you speak a little more on that? Yeah. Uh, so uh, the first band I was able to go on tour with was The Beautiful Mind. Um, uh, plugging them. Uh, the actual artist's name was is John Belly, and he's a uh, he's a pop artist. Uh, genuinely gave me my first opportunity at taking pictures. Um, through him, I was able to make connections through Visionary Music Group, which is the label he's with that has a couple of other really nice artists that um, I really appreciate. One being Logic. I'm a huge Logic fan. Um, Logic. It's, uh, uh, a couple of his shows I was able to take pictures of. Um, and through that process, that's when I was, like I said, my concert photography really started. I was like, yo, I think this might be the style of photography I want. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I did that. I did stuff for the Sherman Neckties. They're a local band. Shout out to them. Uh, I love Grant. I love Preston, Josh. Uh, they, real good dudes. Um, really like their music. I got to shoot them at the Dogwood Festival back in... I think it was like 19. Yeah, it was 19, 2019. I got to shoot them in the Dogwood Festival. Really enjoyed that. Uh, great time with them. Uh, I've been able to take pictures of, key, or not take pictures, but I shot a music video for Keys. We did it, which is a shout out to her. She's Grant's girlfriend. She's a pop artist in herself. Uh, I actually had no prep time for that music video. She wanted it done on a GoPro and we made it work on a GoPro. Hey. We're both, ext I'm extremely proud of it. Cause like I said, I had no pre-production whatsoever. I had no development. All I know is she was like, Hey, I really want to shoot a music video tonight. I want it to look kind of like this way, this way, and this way. I was like, yo, we can do that. Uh, with the GoPro that you're wanting. She dead ass bought a GoPro and, no lie, sat there, drove to her house. We shot at her house, drove up and down her road for like three hours, shooting enough footage. We we could have done a little bit differently that way because I felt like the video got stagnant. Uh, I'm sure she feels the same way. Uh, mm -hmm. But I was able to throw in like some really cool side effects of like a little scary girl that shout out to Earn, which was uh, her friend or whatnot. That played the scary girl, and we were able to put that together. Uh, Rob Matthews, he's a local dude. I, I took photos of him, did some video work for him. Um, who else? Who else? Who else? Who else? Who else? Oh, Britton Buchanan. Shout out to Britton. Uh, when he came home for his little homecoming shows at the Temple Theater, uh, I did. I was originally I was going to do all four nights for him, but I ended up only doing three nights because the first night I was there as a paying customer and I took pictures of him. The second night he invited me back. I was coming back for the third night, but the Temple Theater. I don't know if I should be saying this, but the Temple Theater actually ejected me from the venue and barred me, saying I was trespassing and trying to solicit selling of photos even though i had confirmation from both britain's parents britain's manager and britain himself that i was able to be there and shoot the show mm -hmm. which low-key really made me mad and it was crazy because that same night after the show he's like hey i thought you were coming to shoot and they seen you out there i was like oh no i had all the intentions of being there i got banned or ejected and barred from being at the temple theater and he was like Bro, come tomorrow night, like, we got this. So I was able to shoot three of his four nights, uh, and I, I really, really enjoyed that, which uh, those can be seen on my Instagram, the shots of um, the shots of the Britain shows, mm -hmm. and uh, made a really good connection with Britain Buchanan that way. Uh, so shout out to him. If you ain't got, went and got his new single, I think it dropped this week, or it might be next week it drops. Go check that out. Uh, he's really cool. He's a different type of artist, more soulful type artist. I, I enjoy listening to his stuff. Um, 
couple of like low key people up in New York. I was able to take some photos of and do some video work for band wise. That like that sure they didn't really turn out to do anything major, but it was always cool. Uh, did stuff for our last night. They came to the Cat's Cradle, shot video of them. Through them, got to or not vi uh, video, but took photos of them. Through them, I was given the opportunity to meet what is now one of my favorite bands, Don Brocco. They're from overseas, uh, the UK. They do some really cool, like crazy music that it's rock and roll. You wouldn't think it's rock and roll or, mm -hmm. or like how they do it, but, but they're really cool. And so, I mean, cool. your work is your work is touching the UK, man. Look at you, man. Uh, so, I mean, <laughs> so, so like I, I got a little I got a little pool. I mean, I, I try not to show off what little bit I have. Uh, my biggest thing has always been it's not who, you know, it's uh, well, the saying is it's not what you know, it's who, you know, for me, it's not who, you know, or more so it's who, you know, gets you in the room. But what you know is what keeps you in the room. And I, I stand by that daily because of the simple fact, sure, somebody can put me in a situation, but somebody can put me in the situation and everything like that. But even though you put me in the situation to where I'm doing something, I can't genuinely uh, stay there if I don't know anything about what I'm doing. And I apologize. That was my little nephew running in the room. So oh, You're fine, man. <laughs> it's all good. I got, um, this one's come from uh, Jessica. She says, I'm a new model, but, um, or so I'm new to modeling, but I was wondering, since you're a photographer, what are some of the best poses slash settings to do um, a great photo shoot? Simple. Um, whatever you're comfortable with. A lot of people, they see stuff that like other people are doing, and that's not what you should be doing. You want to do something that you're comfortable with. Uh, a lot of people, they're like, oh, I want to do Bodor. Well, have you done anything remotely like Bodor? No. Have you done anything remotely close to, no. I, I take some selfies. I do this. I, <laughs> well, for instance, Bodor, you dress provocatively. Usually it's meant for people who are overseas. They send it to their husbands and whatnot. I'm like, okay, so with Bodor, uh, are you comfortable like being in a bra and underwear? Well, no. Odor is not what you want then. I mean, but as for like poses, just the best way to figure out like what type of poses you want, I would suggest going through looking at poses that are generic poses. You've seen them. They look really good to your eye. And then from the process of them looking good to your eye, take them to your photographer. And then after you take them to your photographer, be like, hey, can you give me something like this, but in your own way? Because you don't want to be exactly the same every single time. You want to sit there and you want to be able to be like, this is my idea. Can you please do it in your way, but give me something similar to this? So consume large amounts of uh, poses that you find that you think looks good for them. Find women with the same body type as you. A lot of women, uh, they might be a little heavier, nothing wrong with that, but they'll find poses that skinny women use or, that, or anorexic looking women, even though they're not anorexic looking. For smaller people, uh, they, they choose those particular poses and then they, they get upset when the photographer gives them those poses but they're like I don't like the way I look here well you chose a pose that's not really meant for your body type so always look at the poses you want but make sure make sure they have work similar to what you're looking for just because somebody is good at photography doesn't necessarily mean they're good at bow door a lot of people enjoy the bow door shoots I've done but bow door I'm not like I have not done another thing though that you could really do uh like when you're in the mindset of shooting that I do make a playlist uh give it to your photographer and it'd be a playlist of the type of mood you want the shoot to be if you want it to be bubbly get you some like bubbly electric pop type stuff if you want to feel like 
a rocker type thing, get you some heavy metal stuff if that's like the type of shoot you're doing. If you're doing some like, uh, not to keep uh, bragging on it, but like if you're doing Bo Door, get you some like, uh, what's that one song with Nelly Furtado and uh, Promiscuous Girl. Get you some stuff that will make you feel like really confident in yourself, but mm-hmm. also like that you can go off of. Because what I do as an editor is when I go to edit my photos, I'll have them either create a playlist or they tell me what type of shoot they want. And I have a generic playlist I implement. And I'm like, okay, this is what I want from you. What are the poses you're wanting though? Okay, cool. Here's the music to help go with the poses you want. And then you go from all of that, you start shooting. And then from the moment that you start shooting, those particular poses, my bad, my bad. <laughs> when you go from shooting those particular poses, for instance, you'll sit there and go into the aspect of, um, I'm losing my train of thought. Ashton, please stop. Uh, I understand. But uh, you go from those particular instances and then from those particular instances, the shoot should go smoothly. You should be comfortable with your photographer and after you're doing that, like, you know what type of shots you want. Mm-hmm. So to wrap that all up, because I know that was all bundled around, uh, make sure first and foremost, you're comfortable with the photographer. The photographer has the work that you're wanting or something similar. Uh, digest tons of pages, but don't go so far as to thinking, oh, I got to look this particular way. Some people look absolutely stunning with no makeup. Some people need makeup. Not that that's a bad thing. I know I say that wrongly how I put it, but sometimes like it does help accent the actual shoot. Mm -hmm. Uh, But in just tons of photos of the type of shoot you're looking at, then look at the shoots that work with your body type. Always go for your body type or slightly around your body type. Never never sit there and go for somebody that you know for a fact is not your body type. Because all it's going to do is destroy your confidence as a beginning model uh, to continue with the with the actual art of modeling. I can't tell you the number of people I've actually shot, created gorgeous portfolios for. They work really good, but because of the simple fact that they didn't have the body type and they didn't have the actual like way they wanted to look exactly like the people they were looking at to create the portfolio, they gave up modeling after like one or two shoots. And it, it it's truly upsetting. Awesome, man. So Jessica, I hope you uh, definitely took that to heart. Just like he said, be comfortable is the most important thing. I got, um, got some more from you. Uh, this one comes from Alvon. He says, what made you do MMA and what advice would you give someone who's looking to get into MMA? All right, somebody who wants to get into what what got originally it was just I wanted to relieve some anger. Uh, like I said, the inferiority complex kind of like made me angry a lot. Um, because but the best thing was was to find a way to channel that anger into something productive. Um, plus I was always like, you know what, I think I could fight, even though I knew I had no striking capabilities whatsoever. I was like, fuck it, whatever. Um Somebody wanting to start out, do not expect to train two, three weeks and get into a fight. Do not expect you to train two or three weeks and be like a absolute genius at something. Um, some things will come natural. Some things won't. For instance, the guillotine. You ask me to Oma Plata, I might be able to hit an Oma Plata. I might be able to do a Go-Go Plata. I might be able to do like an Ashigarami, which is a variation of a single ankle lock, uh, I might be able to pull those off. You ask me to do a guillotine, I'm going to pull a guillotine off. Uh, But never sit there and be discouraged. Understand you're going to, if you're doing MMA, you're going to get, you're going to get literally the the shit beat out of you if you think all you're going to do is MMA. Don't go to a gym where they classify it as an MMA gym. Go to a gym where they have a style they prioritize. But then after they prioritize that style, they have multiple branches, if you will, mm. of 
uh, things they do. For instance, the gym I go to is primarily a jiu-jitsu gym. However, that said, through the jiu-jitsu gym, they have days where they do judo. They have days where it is just striking incorporated. And then once in a blue moon, they'll factor it in. Like I said, when somebody has a fight camp, they'll factor it in more. But once in a blue moon, they have a MMA session where they put everything together to make it MMA. There is no true MMA style. You just want a foundation style and then slowly branch out into other opportune moments to uh, the style. Awesome. So then I got, <laughs> I got three questions from Jordan. So this one, I think you kind of oh, answered hold on. it. Hold on. But, Jordan Rankin? Yes, Jordan Rankin. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> hey, shout shout out to Jordan. Thank you for participating. You know, that's my that's my bro right there. He's he's a he's a funny guy, interesting yeah. young man, yeah. <laughs> an asshole at times, but interesting. <laughs> no, nah, it's all good. He uh, his question he got. What drove you to learn MMA? That's his first one. Or do you want me just want me uh, tell them all, or just go one by one? Uh, what drove me to want to do MMA, keeping it short and sweet, because we kind of already touched on it. I yeah. had, I have an, in, truthfully, I have an inferiority complex, but at the same time, I was always thinking, one, I have anger issues at times, two, find a positive way to channel the anger issues, but also I just want to be good at something besides photography, because photography is good, it can take you places, and so can the cinematography and the film world and everything. But like, you want to do something that's physically active. I was, I, I enjoyed the physical aspect of it. Plus, it's nice. Uh, I got like twelve minutes. Go. Uh, I, I sat. To, it's, it's my nephew's bro, uh, birthday, so he's, he's wanting to wait to cut the cake and everything. But um, got you, man. Uh, but we're sitting there, and I want to sit there and do stuff under the aspect of like I wanted to just learn how to, basically learn how to fight. I mean. But at the same time, when it came to the MMA portion of everything, be like, well, the only way, you can learn how to fight as much as you want, but can you fight? The only way you can find out if you can fight is throwing yourself in those in those uh, situations. That's true. His and it one... being a uh, being a safe way, because if you go to a street fight, you fight even if you're knocked unconscious. People will still end up hitting you, at least if you're either outclassed or you are knocked out, like, these people genuinely sit there and like, okay. True that. His uh, second question is, do you prefer photography or filmology more and why? Well, see, that's a broad. Uh, for a career path, photography, it's easier, quicker money. The overall art, uh, cinematography. Um Cinematography, just because it's gorgeous, it's something that I fall in love with. I can take a single image and I can change your, uh, I can change your perspective on certain things, but I can take a series of images that make a certain scene, and through that certain scene, I can change the way you view whatever I'm trying to do. You can hate Trump, for instance. I know he loves some Trump. You can absolutely hate Trump, but I can cut together something that will make you go from hating Trump to being like, okay, well, I don't like Trump. Or maybe completely rotate everything around and go from that to being, yo, I actually, okay, Trump's not that bad. I can take something to where you absolutely love Trump and I'll, I can do things. Now, that's also propaganda. Don't get me wrong. That's propaganda, mm -hmm. uh, which is something totally different. But I just like the way I can, with cinematography, I can alter the way you think of things as well as I can alter the way you view scenery. It could be hot as shit outside, but the way I shoot it, a gorgeous way to like just view everything so it's definitely photography because it's easier to get money it's, you have a camera you don't have to invest a lot to start photography work uh not necessarily saying buying a camera makes you a photographer does not I uh, the hard way. <laughs> uh, but overall which do i prefer art wise cinematography i just think it's absolutely beautiful Awesome. And his uh, his question, the uh, last question we're going to do, because I know you're busy with your nephew, but he says, uh, this one is a, a joke between y'all. 
He says, best Batman casting, he said, choice ever, made and why. The best Batman. See, we can go different ways with that. Uh, best Batman as Batman, hands down, Ben Affleck. The reason I say Ben Affleck is because he genuinely is what I would think if a real life Batman existed. Uh, personally, I would sit there and be frightened to commit any type of crime if there was even a slight possibility this big ass dude hits me one time, caves in my chest, I'm dead. Now, all of them probably, well, not all of them. Christian Bell's probably would do it. Robert Pattinson's, we ain't seen a lot of, but from that little skit, we or not skit, but that uh, particular scene we've seen in the teaser, he probably fucked me up pretty badly. Uh, Michael Keaton, I, I think I could give Keaton a run for his money, especially now that he old, just pop, pop, pop. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think Robert Ke uh, or uh, Keaton, Michael Keaton, I, I think personally I could give Keaton a run for his money. George Clooney, absolutely. And George Clooney. Uh, bat nipples, whatever. A absolutely stupidest invention for George Clooney's Batman ever. Um, but as for as of what we have right now, best Bruce Wayne is definitely Christian Bale. Best Batman's Ben Affleck's Batman. Awesome, man. Thank you uh, once again, Alfred, for uh, agreeing to be on the show, man. Uh, great, like, details and insight that you put in just in, you know, the cinema side of the world, the photographer side of the world, and the martial arts uh, side of the world. I mean, sky's the limit for you, man. I wish you nothing but success in all three of them uh, professions. Is there anything that you want to plug in or, uh, you know, put in your uh, Instagram or uh, Facebook, Twitter, anything you want to plug, any projects uh, working on? Okay, so real quick, I'm not on Facebook. Probably might get back on Facebook here after a while. But my Instagram is at Graham Crackers or Graham Cracker, uh, play on my last name. Mm -hmm. um, also, the fact that I'm tan, Graham Crackers are tan. Uh, but uh, I don't have a Twitter. I uh, don't have a YouTube. However, definitely be keeping an eye because uh, one of the ideas I have is my own version of an embedded series. I have a couple of people I'm talking to about, but it more so instead of it being a fight, we could be in the entire fight camp. Okay. Um, I because th I think that'd be really cool. Uh, Sounds cool. I, I've got some I've got some footage of some stuff I cut together just to like tease, not necessarily tease people, but get people in, interested in helping produce. And everything so far has been relatively. Like, yo, th this is cool. Because the tagline is, so you want to be a fighter. A lot of people think, oh, I go to the gym, I do this, I do this, and I'm a fighter. No, deep dive into the fighter lifestyle. Um, and the reason I'm doing this is because I talked to one person that was doing it, and, like, we were on the same mindset. And this ain't me shitting on them, but I am kind of shitting on them. Their final project was nowhere near what we said or he said it was and where we were connecting. So this is kind of me kind of like flexing a little bit, talking about like, uh, okay, well, my project's definitely going to be better in covering what I said it was going to be covering and it being consistent instead of like not really consistent and all over the place type thing. Um, but shout out to Samantha Seth. Uh, when you go onto my Instagram, the last picture I took was a year ago of her that I uploaded on there. Uh, the Wolf Queen, shout out to her. She makes her pro MMA debut Halloween night this year. Uh, she'll be in Myrtle Beach. Uh, I can sit there, give you all the information. Her fight is a, like, $5 pay-per-view fight. You get some. This is what I was talking about, guys, where there's multiple levels to being a professional fighter. She's just now getting to where she is making her pro debut. And, honestly, I think she could possibly in the next, like, two, three fights be on something like Invicta. I don't think she's okay. UFC level right now, but Invicta ain't far from UFC. Um, really. I definitely think she. I definitely think she's upper level, uh, mid level right now. Professional. Uh, her amateur record was six and four, and one of the wins technically they won't count. So technically she'd be seven and four, uh, but she didn't make the right medical thing, which is something we would talk about in my uh, my project. But. Um, She's six and four. 
she won the Spartaca strawweight amateur belt, and then she won Cage Wars atom weight belt. Strawweight for you guys is 115 pounds. Atom weight's 105 pounds. Shout out to her. Shout out to Elias Briley. He trains out at uh, Team Abu. He's a professional fighter of one win, one loss. Dude's nonstop working. Uh, please, somebody get this man a fight. All he wants to do is fight. Shout out to Isaiah Monroe. He made his pro debut a month or two ago. Won by guillotine first round, a minute and five seconds into the round. You taught him uh, that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was like, yeah. <laughs> nah, nah, I ain't teaching that. Ain't teaching that <laughs> um, so shout, shout out to him. Uh, da, 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 da. Shout out to Adrian Soto Perez. Mad love for him. He just had his son, Angel, born. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, currently in an incubator. He's a fighter already at a young age of just being born. Uh, hold your head up. You got this, bro. And then, of course, shout out to Professor Tanyel, currently in Florida doing Pan Ams, which is like the second biggest jiu-jitsu tournament in the world, if I'm not mistaken. He Man. won his first He won his first match. Uh, he's got one more match, and then I think he's got a championship match if he wins. Shout out to him. Shout out Coach Brad. He went down today for his brown belt tournament, uh, same place. Uh, and then, of course, shout out to Will. He's down there as well. So, mad love to all of them guys. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome, man. Thank you, man. Have a great day, man. Or a great night, I should say. <laughs> and right. continue all to right. go strong, brother. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Later. All right, bro.